that rabbits were taking over their pastoral properties. The greatest animal pest of all is the rabbit. In the fields of Australia, hunters and farmers are facing a major challenge. Wide margins with rough grassland, that is, encourages small mammal populations. Millions of rabbits invasion. Rabbits are one of the most destructive invasive species in Australia. And these rabbits are not just causing harm to crops, they are as well wreaking havoc on the ecosystem. What tactics can farmers employ to manage the overwhelming rabbit population? We've got this outer fence and we've got a woven wire product up here, which is... Join us as we find out how Australian farmers and hunters deal with millions of invasive rabbits. Rabbits are Australia's most costly vertebrate pest, causing over $200 million in lost agricultural production. A furry foe introduced with good intentions has become a devastating pest. This is the story of the rabbit plague in Australia, a battle fought for over a century with far-reaching consequences. The first rabbits hopped onto Australian shores in 1788 aboard the First Fleet. Initially kept as pets and for sport hunting, their seemingly harmless charm masked a potent reproductive prowess. The Commonwealth of Australia, the greatest animal pest of all, is the rabbit. Unburdened by natural predators and thriving in the continent's abundant grasslands, their numbers exploded. By 1880, an estimated 600 million rabbits ravaged the land, earning the moniker the Rabbit Plague. There were an estimated 36 million rabbits. The rabbits' impact was immediate and brutal. They devoured crops, decimated native vegetation, and outcompeted native herbivores. Their burrowing habits caused soil erosion, leading to desertification in some areas. The delicate balance of Australia's ecosystems was thrown into chaos. The Australians knew they had to act. The rabbit war began with a series of desperate measures. Fences stretching for thousands of kilometres were erected only to be breached by the agile rabbits. With rabbits able to produce seven litters a year. Poisoning campaigns, though effective locally, proved unsustainable and harmful to other wildlife. Desperate for a solution, scientists turned to biological warfare. In 1950, the myxoma virus, a rabbit-specific disease, was released. It initially caused a 90% population decline, offering a glimmer of hope. However, like all good war stories, the rabbits adapted, developing resistance, and the battle continued. Fertile grazing land. Grasslands are laid bare as rabbits destroy vegetation, which keeps the soil together. Today, the estimated rabbit population stands at around 200, 300 million. A far cry from the peak, but still a significant threat. Farmers still grapple with the damage caused by grazing and burrowing, and native species remain vulnerable. The fight against the rabbits is now a multi-pronged approach. The myxoma virus is still employed, along with another callus virus, both in targeted releases and genetic modifications to maintain their effectiveness. Biological controls, like rabbit-specific predators, are being explored. Research into immunocontraception, which would limit rabbit reproduction, is also ongoing. As we grasp the historical roots of Australia's rabbit plague, a pressing question emerges. How are farmers on the front lines combating this relentless invasion today? Join us in the next chapter to unravel the defensive tactics and innovative strategies employed in the ongoing battle against rabbit infestations. The rabbit plague isn't just an ecological crisis, it's a war waged on the farmlands of Australia. Millions of hungry mouths devour crops, chew through fences, and leave behind a trail of destruction. But Australian farmers, renowned for their ingenuity and grit, have developed an arsenal of strategies to defend their livelihoods. The rain was such that the, uh, the vegetation out, outgrew the rabbits and it gave a chance to get away. Imagine a field of golden wheat ripe for harvest. Now picture a wave of furry brown locusts descending, gnawing down stalks and leaving behind a wasteland. This is the reality for many Australian farmers. Rabbits, with their insatiable appetites and rapid breeding, can decimate entire crops in a matter of days. Beyond the devastation to food sources, the rabbits wreak havoc on the land itself. 
They burrow extensively, creating intricate tunnels that disrupt drainage patterns and lead to soil erosion. Their grazing habits strip away native vegetation, destabilizing fragile ecosystems and further impacting biodiversity. The first line of defense for many farmers is a sturdy fence. No rabbit-proof barrier exists, but new technologies are constantly being developed. Electric fences, for example, deliver a mild shock that deters the rabbits from approaching. Some farmers experiment with double fences, with an outer wire mesh fence and an inner net fence to trap the rabbits between them. So take a look at this fence. We've got this outer fence and we've got a woven wire Scent repellents made from natural or synthetic ingredients are another weapon in the farmer's arsenal. These repellents sprayed on fences or applied directly to crops emit odors that rabbits find unpleasant, discouraging them from entering the area. However, the effectiveness of repellents can vary depending on the type of rabbit, the weather conditions, and the application method. Thinking like a rabbit can be the key to outsmarting them. Farmers are increasingly adopting habitat modification techniques to make their land less appealing. This includes clearing dense vegetation that provides cover for rabbits, planting native grasses that are less palatable, and creating nesting sites for owls and other natural predators. The base of hedgerows are really, really important. And if we can have wide margins with rough grassland, that is, encourages small mammal populations, provides suitable foraging habitat for barn owls. Meet John Smith a sheep farmer in New South Wales. For years, rabbits were a constant thorn in his side, decimating his pastures and reducing his flock's productivity. Then he heard about a new type of fencing, a combination of electric wire and a physical barrier. John took the plunge and installed the new fence around his most vulnerable fields. The results were immediate. Rabbit numbers dropped dramatically and his sheep finally had a chance to graze in peace. Stories like John's are beacons of hope in the fight against the rabbit plague. They demonstrate the power of innovation and adaptation in the face of adversity. Farmers are not just passive victims. They are active participants in this ecological battle, constantly experimenting and sharing their knowledge to find new solutions. The fight against the rabbit plague is not just about protecting crops and land. It's about protecting the livelihoods and way of life of Australian farmers. These are the people who feed the nation, and their resilience in the face of this ongoing challenge is an inspiration to us all. The rabbit plague is a complex issue with no simple solutions. However, the stories of farmers on the front line show that progress is possible. By supporting research and development of new control methods, sharing best practices, and raising awareness of the challenges faced by farmers, we can all play a role in mitigating the impact of this invasive species. Remember, the battle against the rabbit plague is not just about protecting Australian agriculture, it's about protecting the delicate balance of our ecosystem and the future of our planet. With crops and land bearing the brunt of rabbit infestations, farmers stand resilient in their strategies. Now, we shift our focus to skilled marksmen, and the crucial role they play in managing rabbit populations. How do hunters navigate this challenge? The answers await in our next chapter. As the rabbit population challenge continues, a new character enters the scene, the hunter. While often a subject of controversy, responsible hunters play a vital role in dealing with rabbit overgrowth through carefully controlled hunting and culling initiatives. Let's look into the ups and downs of this matter. Hunters, frequently viewed with mixed opinions, have become pivotal figures in addressing the rabbit plague. It's important to emphasize that responsible hunters are those who adhere to regulations and guidelines set by authorities. These individuals undergo training to acquire the skills needed for precise and humane hunting practices. Controlling the population of certain animals like rabbits is important to keep things in balance. When there are too many rabbits, it can cause problems for the environment and agriculture. Ethical and effective culling or targeted removal is a way to manage this. Landholders were beginning to complain bitterly that rabbits were taking over their pastoral properties. One common method is shooting. Skilled hunters use guns to carefully aim and shoot rabbits. This requires a lot of training, 
following strict rules, and making sure to handle the rabbit remains responsibly. Now, this is an active warren. Has RCD worked? Another way is trapping. Live traps are used to catch rabbits without harming them. Once caught, the rabbits can be dealt with in different ways. They might be put to sleep or moved somewhere else. The choice depends on the plan and the local rules in place. In 2017, the latest weapon was deployed. Okay. A more scientific approach is biological control. This involves introducing viruses that specifically target rabbits. These viruses, like calicivirus, can help bring down the rabbit population. However, using this method requires a lot of caution. We need to think about possible unintended problems and make sure it's done with careful oversight. Tiding over with this copper bird, which is pretty typical of... Overall, controlling rabbit populations is like finding a balance. Too many rabbits can be a problem, but we also need to be careful how we manage them. Shooting, trapping, and using viruses are all tools we can use, but they come with responsibilities. Hunters need training and rules to follow. Traps need to be humane. And introducing viruses needs to be done with a watchful eye on possible side effects. But it became clear while the virus was knocking down about a third of the rabbits at release sites. When done the right way, culling helps keep the number of rabbits in check. This is not just good for the rabbits themselves, but also for the places they live and the farms that need protection. So it's a bit like finding the right recipe using the right amount of shooting, trapping, and biological control to make sure everything stays in balance. Um, I think that would have been the last rule. Now, when it comes to hunting rabbits in Australia, there are strict rules set by the state and territory governments. These rules are like a playbook to make sure hunting is done in a responsible way and doesn't harm the rabbit population. With rabbits able to produce seven litters a year. In New South Wales, if you want to hunt rabbits, you need a game hunting license. It's like a special permission slip. But that's not all. You also need the landowner's permission to hunt on their private property. If you're eyeing state forests, there's an extra step. You need a restricted game hunting license for those areas. Jumping over to Victoria, it's a similar story. You must have a game hunting license, just like in New South Wales. And again, you need the green light from the landowner if you want to hunt on their private land. To keep things fair and sustainable, there are specific times of the year, known as seasons, when you can hunt, and there are limits on how many rabbits you can bag. So there'll be people who are watching this who say they can still see loads of rabbits on their properties. In Queensland, there's a bit more flexibility. You can go after rabbits during an open season, but there's a catch. You need a recreational hunting permit. Of course, you still have to get the nod from the landowner to hunt on their private turf. However, it's not a free-for-all. There are closed seasons when you can't hunt, and there are limits on how many rabbits you can take down. These rules might seem like a bit much, but they're designed to make sure hunting doesn't get out of hand. Licenses and permits act like a screening process, making sure hunters are responsible and know the rules. Getting the landowner's permission adds another layer, ensuring hunters respect private property. Maybe I missed it for a second, I thought, oh no. The seasons and bag limits are like guardrails, preventing hunters from going overboard. They help keep the rabbit population in check without risking their survival. His worries were probably, are these rabbits gonna survive? So when it comes to hunting rabbits in Australia, it's not just about grabbing a gun and heading out. It's about following a set of rules to make sure everything stays balanced and sustainable. A wild rabbit is a classic prey animal. When it comes to the ethics of hunting rabbits, it's a tricky subject that sparks a lot of debate. But responsible hunters have a clear set of principles they follow. <laughs> Firstly, there's the idea of selective targeting. This means focusing specifically on rabbits and making sure other animals aren't harmed in the process. It's like having a target list and making sure you stick to it. Contracted shooting, we're on a rabbit job this time. Then there's the importance of humane methods. Ethical hunters want to make sure that when rabbits are culled, it's done in a way that minimizes their suffering. It's about being respectful and considerate, even in the act of culling. Sustainability is another key factor. Responsible hunters aim to keep rabbit populations healthy. They don't want to overhunt and risk throwing things out of balance. It's like keeping the natural order in check. 
Collaboration is a big part of the ethical considerations. Hunters work closely with wildlife management authorities and landowners. It's not a solo mission. It's a team effort to make sure things are done right. Friend ran off, but I to get one. Relying solely on hunting won't cut it when it comes to managing rabbit populations effectively. It takes a mix of strategies, and here are a few key ones. First up is habitat modification. This involves changing the landscape to make it less rabbit friendly. Think of it like rearranging the furniture so that rabbits don't find the place as cozy. This can be done through managing vegetation and doing something called warren ripping, which disrupts rabbit burrows. Another approach is bringing back natural predators. Introducing foxes and dingoes, which are natural enemies of rabbits, can help keep their numbers in check. Of course, this has to be done in a controlled way to avoid unintended consequences. Then there's the world of research and development. Investing in new and clever ways to control rabbits is crucial. Scientists are exploring biological control agents, basically things that target rabbits specifically. They're also looking into fertility control technologies, which could help manage rabbit populations in a more controlled manner. Northern areas for uh, rabbit fleas to release. So effective rabbit control is like a three-legged stool. You've got habitat modification, predator reintroduction, and cutting edge research all working together. It's not just about hunting, it's about reshaping the environment, bringing in natural checks, and staying ahead with innovative solutions. That way we can tackle the rabbit challenge from multiple angles. The telltale sign that this rabbit died from rabbit hemorrhagic disease. As hunters set their sights on pigeon control, the landscape shifts to innovations and research. What cutting-edge technologies and scientific inquiries are shaping the future of managing these avian invaders? In the ongoing rabbit saga, there's a hot debate about two microscopic warriors, the myxoma virus and the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, RHDV. These tiny soldiers have been cutting down rabbit numbers, but it's not a simple victory. Let's dig into the world of biological control, looking at how well it works what impact it has on the environment and the ethical battles it stirs up. The, the telltale sign that this rabbit died from rabbit hemorrhagic disease. First, we have the myxoma virus unleashed in 1950. It hit rabbits like a biblical plague, dramatically dropping their numbers by a whopping 99%. It was a powerful weapon, but rabbits are crafty creatures. They evolved and developed resistance, like building armor against an enemy. This forced scientists back to the drawing board, searching for a new plan. Who say they can still see loads of rabbits on their properties. Then comes RHDV, making its entrance in 1995. It's a sneakier and deadlier warrior. Like Myxoma, it helped bring down rabbit populations, but it had a twist. Its influence spread beyond just rabbits, causing concerns about unintended damage. It's like trying to hit one target, but accidentally hitting something else nearby. Now let's break it down a bit. These viruses are part of a strategy called biological control. The idea is to use natural enemies, in this case viruses, to control a pest population, in this case rabbits. It's like using a virus as a secret weapon against the rabbits. A virus is never gonna take out every last rabbit and rabbits, as we know, breed like rabbits. But here's where things get tricky. While these viruses are effective in reducing rabbit numbers, they don't discriminate. They can affect other animals too. And that raises worries about messing up the balance of nature. They will nurse their babies once, sometimes twice a day, just for a few minutes. And there's more to the story, the ethical side. Using viruses to control animals brings up questions about whether it's the right thing to do. Are we interfering too much with nature? The viral warriors, myxoma and rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, RHDV, have proven their effectiveness in battling the rabbit plague. Myxoma's initial strike in 1950 was like a knockout punch, slashing rabbit numbers by an astonishing 99%. RHDV, introduced in 1995, continues to stand as a crucial defender of Australian ecosystems. 
These viruses act like guardians, keeping the rabbit population in check. However, just like any powerful weapon, they require constant attention. Rabbits are no slouches in the evolution game, and they've developed resistance. This means scientists need to stay on their toes, constantly researching and developing new viral strains or alternative methods to stay ahead in the ongoing battle. The greatest animal pest of all is the rabbit. Rabbits are there. Looking beyond the battlefield, the impact of these viruses extends far and wide. With rabbits under control, native vegetation gets a chance to thrive. This creates safe havens for endangered species and helps restore delicate ecosystems. It's like giving the green light to a healthier environment. They can have a litter of five baby bunnies, called kits, every month or two, and then... Additionally, the story goes beyond just plants. The reduced pressure from herbivores, thanks to the viruses, allows predator populations to bounce back. This creates a more balanced food web, with predators feasting on a controlled number of herbivores. However, amidst this success, there are shadows to contend with. RHDV, while effective, doesn't always hit its target precisely. Concerns arise about its potential impact on native hair species, emphasizing the need for careful monitoring and ongoing research. It's like trying to hit one specific thing, but accidentally affecting something else nearby. Well, in doing the rabbit farming, we have to be consistent in all aspects. The ethical debates add another layer to the tale. While these viruses do their job in controlling rabbit populations, they also cause suffering. Critics argue for alternative methods, sparking heated discussions about the ethics of using disease as a weapon in the battle against pests. These 300 rabbits a second chance at life. Biological control, wielding viral warriors, offers a potent weapon against the rabbit plague. But with it comes a heavy crown of ethical and ecological complexities. By embracing scientific rigor, open dialogue, and responsible research, we can navigate this thorny path, ensuring that our fight against one invasive species doesn't inadvertently wound the delicate web of life that sustains us all. As technology takes the spotlight, real-world success stories beckon. Join us in exploring how communities, farmers, and hunters unite to create effective solutions. What lessons can we learn from these stories as we look toward the future of pigeon control? Before any of these badgers can take their first... In Australia, rabbits have woven themselves into the stories passed down through generations. Kids get a kick out of tales like Boonyip, a monstrous rabbit that's said to hang out in waterways. It's like a mix of folklore and a creature feature, adding a bit of excitement to bedtime stories. For the grown-ups, there are stories of clever jackrabbits outsmarting dingoes or causing mischief on outback farms. These stories aren't just about rabbits. They show off a unique Australian sense of humor, finding a good laugh even when dealing with a challenging situation. Carrots and hay and ordinary rabbit food. I this rich oral tradition reflects the way Australians have embraced the rabbit not just as a pest, but as a character in their cultural narrative. It's a bit like turning a nuisance into a part of the family stories that get passed down. But the rabbit's influence goes beyond just tales. They've become culinary curiosities, finding their way onto Australian plates. Some folks have turned the rabbit invasion into a business opportunity, offering products made from rabbit meat. It's like turning lemons into lemonade. In Australia's alpine areas, rabbits must survive. Taking a problem and finding a way to make something positive out of it. Rabbits have hopped their way into various forms of media, from the epic battles in Watership Down to Bugs Bunny's mischievous escapades. In Australia, however, the portrayal of these furry creatures takes on a distinct local flavor. Children's books such as Mem Fox's Koala Loo and picture books like Wombat Stew were asked to come up with a solution playfully integrate rabbits into stories alongside native wildlife. Movies like Rabbitohs and Storm Boy delve into the complex relationship between humans and these fuzzy invaders. Through these narratives, Australians grapple with the reality of the rabbit plague while celebrating the undeniable role of rabbits in the national consciousness. A year after the escape, the Khaleesi virus... Interestingly, rabbit meat, once a staple in bush tucker, 
is now experiencing a gourmet renaissance. Chefs at trendy restaurants like Vue du Monde in Melbourne and Gertrude's in Fitzroy are crafting innovative dishes such as rabbit ragu with polenta and grilled rabbit with fig chutney. Most of the rabbit meat is consumed in European countries. Which... Farmers markets have also joined the trend, offering ethically sourced rabbit to appeal to a growing number of consumers seeking sustainable and flavorful meat. This shift in the culinary scene marks a fascinating turn in the rabbit's story. 21 days. The young will spend much time at the entrance of the burrow. From being viewed as an agricultural pest to becoming a sought-after delicacy. In essence, rabbits aren't just characters in stories or pests to be managed. They've become culinary inspirations and cultural icons in Australia, demonstrating the multifaceted ways in which humans interact with these creatures. The rabbit's journey from the pages of children's books to gourmet restaurant menus showcases the adaptability of Australian perspectives embracing the challenges posed by the rabbit plague and transforming them into opportunities for creativity and culinary exploration. Although the Australian rabbit fur industry has faded into history, rabbit fur is experiencing a revival in the realm of sustainable fashion. Craftsmen and women like Lucy Launder and Louise Ferguson are repurposing discarded rabbit fur into lavish hats scarves and accessories. Through their creative work, these designers not only give a second life to a natural resource, but also contribute to raising awareness about responsible consumption and the importance of reducing waste.